Okay, hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome to, uh, what are we, in week five now of the course, I believe. Uh, today we are going to start looking more at uh, some of the institutions and actors who are responsible for making foreign policy in the United States. Uh, thus far, we've focused more on uh, the history of U.S. foreign policy up to and including the Cold War. Uh, we've, uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the important actors and individuals who are responsible for making U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but over the next few weeks, we're going to shift to thinking more specifically about these actors and the institutions uh, that craft foreign policy and that, that produce foreign policy more generally. Then beyond that, after another uh, three or four weeks of this, we're going to start getting into the specific, uh, specific kind of topical areas of U.S. foreign policy making, like the use of military force uh, and trade and things of that sort. So for today, uh, we are going to start off here by uh, thinking about uh, the Congress and the presidency, right? These are the two key institutions that are responsible for making U.S. foreign policy. So today we're gonna to start off by reviewing some of the traditional views of Congress and the presidency and how they relate to foreign policy. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm sort of setting up some straw man arguments here. These are not arguments that political science uh, really take all that seriously at this point, uh, but they do have kind of some historical cachet and some folks who write about foreign policy outside of the discipline uh, still tend to kind of think about uh, Congress and the presidency in these terms. So it can be useful to, to just be aware of these arguments and these frameworks, these lenses through which people view Congress and the presidency. Uh, next, we're going to review institutional powers of uh, Congress and the presidency here. And to preview this, um, you know, the way that we typically think about the separation of powers isn't really a useful way to think about it. Uh, and so I'm going to lift from uh, Richard Neustadt here and, and his view of uh, the presidency. Uh, this view requires us to think about uh, institutions sharing powers rather than a kind of clear division of powers. And this is uh, one place where I do think that language matters in terms of how we view uh, the problem. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go, but there are three key areas that we're going to look at here. Uh, one concerns appointments, the power to appoint members of the foreign policy bureaucracy, which is uh, pretty big, and we'll talk more about the foreign policy bureaucracy a little bit over the next few weeks. Uh, though there's so much to cover, we will not cover all of it. Uh, so just a heads up on that point. Next here, we'll talk about international agreements like treaties. This is a really big and important area, uh, but it's one that is a little bit more complex than is often portrayed in the media uh, and uh, is often a little bit more uh, mushy and kind of malleable, I think, than we, we often like to, to think. Um, next and finally, we're going to talk about war and conflict and think about uh, the ways in which Congress and the executive branch share powers with respect to war making. This is another area where, especially as we've seen over the past uh, you know, almost 20 years at this point, um, the relationships are much harder to pin down and a lot more malleable than I, I think a lot of us are kind of uh, taught to uh, think in primary and secondary education. Uh, now, many of you may have actually at this point, it's a little bit frightening for me to say, uh, but may have been born after 9-11. And so witnessing this change or this growth uh, is, is an experience that many of you might not have, though you may have read about it. And people who are a little bit older, uh, you know, may have some more direct experience uh, thinking about these issues or sort of witnessing these issues unfolding in real time. So this is a really important area and it represents uh, one of the, the kind of key areas of executive legislative relations of uh, kind of relationships between uh, different institutions within the federal government that you know, most of us think about when we think about foreign policy making. So first we're going to quickly go over the traditional views that I highlighted before. This is, uh, I, I think, something that can be distilled down into a few really basic points here. The first is that the president enjoys primacy in foreign policy making, right? That the president is, is kind of the designated point person in foreign policy making, and that Congress takes a subservient or sort of secondary role here. Um, this view often holds that this, this is sort of a logical conclusion of the fact that the president is elected by one district, right, by the entire country, and therefore represents the country as a whole. Alternatively, Congress is viewed as relatively unimportant in foreign policy making, uh, 
Uh, and this is uh, partly a byproduct of the fact that you have 535 at this point in time, at least, uh, separate legislators all representing, uh, for the most part, different constituencies outside of the Senate. Uh, and they are subservient to those or beholden to those more particularistic interests. And so they're not taking the entire nation's uh, interests into account when making foreign policy or thinking about foreign policy uh, related issues. Now, briefly, I'll say that this approach has some flaws to it. Um, the, I think the clearest way to illustrate this is that, uh, you know, oftentimes legislators, uh, even members of the House, for example, do have real concerns, right? So if we have, a, you know, a number of veterans who were elected over the past 20 years to the House of Representatives, a lot of those folks might be motivated to seek electoral office because they really care about foreign policy uh, and they really care about the trajectory of U.S. foreign policy more generally. And sometimes this is, uh, you know, the result of their their time in uh, uniform service. Uh, similarly, other people who work in maybe the intelligence community or have a foreign affairs background, right, they might really care about U.S. foreign policy, uh, broadly speaking, and so they pursue elected office uh, to affect some sort of change in that area. Um, when we look at the president, for example, I think this idea that the president represents uh, kind of the, the holistic sort of national interest, which we've already talked about this concept and how there are problems with it, uh, but I think this idea breaks down when we start to think about the fact that, um, you know, in, in very crude numbers here, right, um, half the population doesn't really vote, right? And then of the half that does vote, half or a little under half, right, vote for one party and half votes for another party. And then you maybe have, you know, a few thousand write-ins or, or, you know, other candidates, uh, third party candidates who, who receive votes during elections. And so even the folks who are elected to office uh, are beholden to a constituency that is much smaller than the country as a whole. Now, this doesn't mean that presidents don't care about uh, the, the, the idea of the United States, right, or have specific views or beliefs or policy preferences about what is good for the country as a whole. It doesn't mean that they're always only pursuing the interests of those narrow groups, um, but often they are, right? Oftentimes they are representing kind of more narrow, more particularistic interests, just like members of Congress. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes those groups are going to exert a, a disproportionate influence on presidential foreign policy making. Now, the second kind of set of views here that I want to look at is this idea of conflicting institutions. Now, this is one that portrays foreign policy as uh, the object of struggle between an executive branch and a legislative branch. who are always kind of vying for power, wrestling for, for power over foreign policy making. Um, now, this is problematic. The, the most you know, obvious reason is institutions don't do anything, right? They, they don't have preferences. They don't take action apart from the individuals who occupy those institutions and those positions in those institutions, right? So when we think about Congress and the executive branch vying for power, we're really thinking about members of Congress, members of the House, members of the Senate, uh, perhaps coming into conflict with particular uh, presidents at particular points in time over particular policy issues. There is no enduring uh, conflict between the presidency and, uh, and between Congress, apart from uh, the sorts of enduring conflicts that might be passed down from different cohorts of legislators and different executives specifically. Another thing about this that I would uh, argue should uh, lead us to be cautious about this specific line of thinking is that oftentimes when you read foreign policy books that highlight this idea of conflicting institutions, they highlight specific points in time where uh, conflict was particularly high, right? And they often point to World War I, World War II, and the post-Vietnam period, uh, oftentimes just in kind of the wake of these conflicts, perhaps, uh, as in the case of World War II. The problem here becomes really apparent when you look at the composition of government during some of these time periods. Usually, these arguments about conflicting institutions arise at specific moments where we have divided government, right? Where we have a president from one party and at least one chamber of Congress that's controlled by one of the other parties. And so again, we see here that the conflict is a product not of the institutions, which are constant over time, uh, but of the changing nature of the occupants of those institutions. Next, we're going to start talking about the actual institutional powers of the executive branch and of Congress. 
and we're going to think a little bit more about how they share power. Now this idea of sharing power is a really key component here, and as I mentioned before, I'm going to uh, lift from Richard Neustadt here because I, I do think this framework is, is a better way of thinking about uh, the relationship between the presidency and, and, and Congress, the executive and Congress, than the typical uh, separation of powers argument. Uh, Neustadt says here, quote, the Constitutional Convention did not create a system of separated powers. It created a government of separated institutions sharing powers. And I think that this is, uh, again, a really important point here. And especially in the modern era where we think about, for example, Congress not taking action on some particular issue, for example. Well, this is often the result of a conscious decision uh, among party leaders, uh, among legislative leadership, to not take action, right? Or it might reflect a, a disagreement within each party over whether and how they should take action at any given time. Because the reality is Congress has a lot of levers that they could pull. Uh, the House has a lot of levers that they could pull. The Senate has levers that they can pull. And so when we see in action, right, it's this idea of separated powers or the separation of powers might lead us to think that inaction is because there's no power to be had, right? There's no influence to be exerted, but this just isn't true. So when we look at these three specific policy areas that I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll go through each of these and we'll talk a little bit about how and where there are these overlaps. But very briefly, uh, we can see that for appointments, right, the president appoints members of the executive branch officials to uh, lead different executive branch agencies, uh, but they do this with the advice and consent of the Senate. Similarly, international agreements are typically negotiated and implemented by the executive, uh, but they require the advice and consent of the Senate. And there's more to this that we'll talk about shortly. With war and the use of force, the president is the commander in chief of the US military forces, uh, but it's up to Congress to raise and support military forces, to allocate funds, to declare war, and to conduct oversight. And this oversight function applies more generally, right? Not just with the use of military force. So first here, we're going to go through this section on appointments and think a little bit more about uh, the relationship between Congress and the executive as it pertains to appointments, uh, but only in the field of foreign policy making, right? So there's a lot of stuff that we could cover here uh, when it comes to appointments in the executive branch more broadly. There are thousands of political appointees that accompany new presidential administrations uh, after an election. Um, and this is just way too much ground to cover. We're not even going to cover everything that we would uh, normally discuss in the context of foreign policy making. So just be aware of that, right? We're going to hit some of the high points here that will, again, hopefully give you uh, the, the kind of big picture, right, sense of what's going on here. In general, though, I want to start you off by thinking about um, this idea that there are kind of two classes of appointments that we should be thinking about. The first is the foreign policy bureaucracy. This is the State Department, Defense, uh, Treasury, even though you might not think of that as a foreign policy agency. Um, but basically, these are the traditional institutions associated with foreign policy making that most of us probably think about. Next is the Executive Office of the President. This might seem a little bit more obscure, but basically this is uh, an organization that was created in 1939 in the Roosevelt administration in response to the growing demands that were placed on the, the executive branch, uh, managing and implementing New Deal era programs and increasingly monitoring and managing the US's uh, emerging response to war in Europe during this time. The government grew massively during this time period, but prior to this, the president really didn't have a lot of staff that, uh, that they could call on to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of government. Um, there were certainly bureaucratic agencies, as we've talked about before, things like the State Department existed before World War II, but they were very, very small in size. Uh, the executive branch just absolutely exploded in size during the 1930s and 1940s, and so it became increasingly difficult for presidents to manage all of this. Now, a couple of figures that I want to show you here to just show you how big the executive branch is compared to other branches of government. Uh, the orange here shows you the executive branch compared to the yellow, which is the legislative and judicial branches combined. Right. There's a, obviously this is from 1962 forward, uh, but there's, you know, it's been mostly steady during this time period. But there is a massive disparity in the size between uh, these, uh, this one branch of government and these other two. Uh, 
Now, aside from just an interesting bit of trivia, if you think about this, this has enormous implications for foreign policy making and policy making in general, right? The executive has a, 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 an enormous well of expertise on which it can draw when making policy. Uh, not just the military, but intelligence officials, right? Diplomats, country uh, experts, uh, development experts, right? There are all sorts of people on whom the president can draw to find out what's going on, uh, you know, where is it happening? What are some possible solutions? Uh, they just, they have um, a, an enormous amount of resources at their command in contrast to the legislative and judicial branches, which don't. Now this gives the executive a massive informational advantage, right? We'll talk about some of the specific advantages that they have later, uh, but this is a huge well of expertise and experience and knowledge that legislators don't have. And this is one of the reasons, as a brief aside, why political scientists are often uh, opposed to term limits is because the legislature in, in many respects has uh, been diminished over the past 60 or 70 years or so uh, and so anything that would curb legislators' ability to more effectively do their job uh, is probably not really great for the quality of governance overall. And legislators accrue an enormous amount of knowledge and expertise and understanding, uh, regardless of the policy area, uh, over time. And so often while we complain about legislators being in office for a long period of time, those are probably the legislators who know the most about their districts, about the economic interests of their districts, what's going on there, uh, other social, political, and economic problems uh, or, or goals that their constituents want. Uh, and so this time in office allows them to level the playing field a little bit, right? And this is a really important point. This breaks down the executive branch going back to 1940 forward. Uh, and as you can see here, um, overall, the executive branch in general has grown during this time. Uh, there's an explosion around the early 1940s as a result of World War II. Most of this is occurring in uh, the military, in the, the Defense Department, and the precursors to the Defense Department. Uh, but you can see, even uh, as the Defense Department itself kind of shrinks over time as we go on here, you can also see here that other branches of government are increasing. Uh, now, this uh, corresponds to uh, the growth of just executive functions and responsibilities more generally. Uh, when we see uh, increasing demand placed on specific programs like Social Security or later Great Society programs, uh, you know, medical programs, um, these things also require more people to implement and monitor and, and kind of police. And so we see a general growth of the federal bureaucracy over time, partly as a reflection of the growth of its responsibilities and the growth of the population uh, over whom the executive has, has some sort of direct uh, kind of authority or responsibility when it comes to some of these programs. Um, now, this is one of my favorite uh, charts. It's a really simple chart, but I think that you know, it goes a long way towards showing just how revolutionary World War II was with respect to the size of the federal government and the changing nature of U.S. responsibilities. Um, this is just a, the State Department over time. It shows you the number of personnel overseas and uh, stationed stateside. And again, we just see this massive spike in the overall number of State Department personnel around 1940. And uh, again, we, it's easy to become just sort of uh, desensitized to or, or immune to appeals of you know, just how revolutionary or watershed uh, or you know, how much a particular moment was a watershed moment in some respects. Uh, but this really shows it, right? It's, it's hard to um, do it justice, but World War II just completely changed the face of U.S. foreign policy. And I think this figure goes a long way towards illustrating that point. Now, this table here just shows you a breakdown of uh, some of the positions, um, again, not all of the positions, but some of the positions in the executive office of the president. Again, this position was, or this office was created in 1939, uh, basically to aid the president in kind of administering the day-to-day -day affairs of government um, and having some, you know, more immediate staff to help them personally manage affairs, right? Not just um, the Department of State or, you know, at this point uh, after 1947, the Department of Defense, uh, but having some sort of in-house staff, so to speak. Um, but these two organizations differ, uh, broadly speaking, right, thinking about them, or these two types of organizations differ, these two 
types or classes of bureaucratic appointments differ uh, not just in geography, right? Some of them are located uh, within the White House. Some of them are located in the case of the executive office of the president, that is uh, nearer to the White House. Whereas other officials like the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State are located in uh, in the Pentagon, right, a ways away, or at Foggy Bottom, the State Department's headquarters. And so they have a degree of autonomy that is, is provided by their geographic distance and, and removal from contact with the president. Now, in a way, this can be a double-edged sword, right? They might have some autonomy in some respects, but it might also diminish their ability to influence the president's thinking or the policy agenda because they don't have access as regularly as other people like uh, the National Security Advisor, who we see over here as the assistant to the president for national security affairs. Um, so those are a couple of differences between these two groups, right? The chief of staff, the national security advisor tend to uh, be more geographically, physically proximate to the president. Um, but this latter group also doesn't require Senate approval, which is really important and helps to explain the rising influence of some of these positions uh, over time, right? The Secretary of State, Defense and Treasury, the big three here, they require Senate approval. And this is kind of a check on presidential power in administering bureaucratic agencies because uh, ostensibly, right, the idea is that Congress, the Senate specifically, uh, is going to uh, have a sort of say, right, in this process, and that there needs to be some level of consensus uh, over the officials who are going to be leading uh, in these key policymaking areas. Now, this, again, doesn't always uh, work out to be the case. Congress has become more deferential in many respects over time, and the growth of these alternative positions like the National Security Advisor uh, have endowed the president with ways to get around some of these checks. Now, one thing that I want to hit on here is this idea that uh, most appointments get through, right? Most appointments are approved by the Senate and they get through um, usually with fairly large majorities, though this may be changing in some cases over time. Um, but this can, at first glance, lead to the impression that Congress just isn't doing its job, right? If, if Congress is just sort of a rubber stamp. But there's a selection effect here, right? There's this idea that presidents are really only choosing people who will get through the process, right? They're not generally going to select people who are going to uh, represent a challenging case. Though this doesn't mean that some members of the Senate might not cause a, a problem for the president if they have other political uh, goals that they want to achieve. Um, now, two examples of this are Charles Bolin on the left here and John Tower on the right. Uh, Charles Bolin was eventually confirmed he was appointed ambassador to the USSR, to the Soviet Union in 1953. He succeeded George Kennan in that post after Kennan was kicked out of the Soviet Union for comparing Stalin to Hitler, which uh, uh, made Stalin very, very mad. And he declared Kennan persona non grata and, and had him removed from the country. Now, uh, Bolin was the subject of uh, a lot of uh, red baiting during this time, right? Uh, he was smeared as a communist or a communist sy sympathizer, as being anti-American, as being too liberal. Uh, this was during the heyday of the McCarthy hearings. And so even though he was eventually confirmed by a vote of 74 to 13, uh, he did endure a kind of arduous confirmation process. Now, in other cases here, John Tower was George H.W. Bush's, George Bush Sr.'s uh, nominee to be Secretary of Defense in 1989. Um, he was ultimately rejected because he had a really terrible reputation for uh, being a drunk, for being an alcoholic, and for being a womanizer. Uh, and ultimately, he was, uh, he was not you know, given the job, right? He had to, had to withdraw. And so rejections do happen sometimes. Right. And so even in the case of Tower, right, whether or not this would happen today is another question. But in the case of Tower, there is some evidence that even being a fellow senator is not enough to uh, to save you if there are serious concerns about your qualifications or ability to perform the job. Now, uh, I keep coming back to Stimson because I think that he's just a really interesting guy. And I did a lot of reading about him during my dissertation research. Uh, but Appointees can be really, really important. And this is something we've hit on before, and I just briefly want to hit on this point again. Uh, but appointees are delegated substantial amounts of responsibility by presidents. They, uh, in many cases, like in Stimson's case, have a tremendous amount of autonomy in terms of implementing policy and, and uh, setting policy in some, some sense, in some cases. Um, and so they are a very important uh, piece of government, right? And they're a part of government that we don't often think about, 
uh, because most of us are not really paying attention to confirmation hearings outside of uh, some hotly contested ones like the, the Kavanaugh uh, hearings when he was nominated for the Supreme Court, for example. Um, and so for the most part, a lot of these political appointees are not people that we typically think about, but they can have a really important impact on the president's ability to relate to Congress. Now, as I mentioned before, some alternatives to these traditional appointees uh, in the State Department and the Defense Department um, exist in the executive office of the president. Again, this was a, a sort of position, so to speak, right, an organism, uh, maybe more appropriately, that was created in 1939 in response to growing demands uh, to allow the president to hire actual staff. Um, cabinet appointments were traditionally relied upon for foreign policy making throughout most of U.S. history. Uh, but again, with the growth of New Deal era programs and the U.S.'s uh, uh, growing uh, involvement uh, leading up to World War II, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of stress placed on the president, and the president needed um, legal authority to actually hire staffers. Right before this uh, time, before the executive office of the president, the president couldn't legally do this. And so it created a weakness in the office's ability to actually effectively meet the challenges of, of governance and implementing uh, its responsibilities and implementing policy. Uh, so again, many key positions within the executive office of the president, like the National Security Advisor, are not subject to Senate approval. So this has contributed to a growth of the importance of this position over time and the National Security Council more broadly, which we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture in another two or three weeks. Um, but a couple of uh, uh, three here kind of notable occupants of the position of National Security Advisor. Uh, Henry Kissinger was famously dual hatted as uh, National Security Advisor and Secretary of State for a time. His successor, uh, Shpignu Brzezinski, uh, I'm never uh, positive that I'm pronouncing his first name correctly, so excuse me for the mispronunciation. Uh, and Condoleezza Rice, uh, George uh, W. Bush's uh, National Security Advisor. Um, these are incredibly important and influential National Security Advisors. There are a lot of others. Uh, Brent Scowcroft, who is a, a, a prominent National Security Advisor, recently just passed away within the past few weeks. Um, and so these are not the only prominent National Security Advisors, but a few to, to be aware of in terms of uh, folks who played a really important role in this position and played a really important role in setting the policy agenda for the administrations uh, of which they were a part. The second section that we're going to talk about here deals with international agreements. Now, as we discussed earlier, right, like appointments, international agreements, generally speaking, require some sort of congressional approval. When we think of treaties, perhaps most prominently, uh, they require the Senate's consent, right? Um, it's actually the president who ratifies the treaty uh, with the approval of the Senate here. Um, but beyond treaties, there are two broad classes of agreements that we're going to talk about here. Treaties are the type that most of us are probably familiar with, uh, but there's also a more general type of agreement called an executive agreement that takes on a couple of different types. It is arguably more important because it has just become such a common mode of establishing agreements between the U.S. and other countries. Now, both Congress and the presidency play an important role, both Congress and the executive play an important role in the treaty-making process, right? We'll talk about treaties first here. Um, now, the executive branch is responsible for negotiating treaties, but the Constitution outlines a role for the Senate specifically. Article 2, Section 2 requires that two-thirds of the Senate must vote in favor of a treaty to pass. And this is a pretty high barrier, right? The Constitution also explicitly says in Article 1, Section 10, that states cannot enter into treaties. This is purely the domain of the national government. Um, and so here the Constitution does explicitly outline a role for the executive and the Senate specifically. Um, however, the House of Representatives also plays an important role here, uh, even though it might not be articulated as clearly, right? Oftentimes international agreements require funding, staffing, things like this, uh, and the House plays an important role in allocating funds that can be used to ultimately implement agreements uh, that are negotiated between the U.S. and other countries. Now, this process also isn't just up or down. It can sometimes be the case that the Senate might uh, approve of a treaty but express reservations that can be articulated, right? If you agree with 90% of a treaty uh, and you don't want to throw it out because you disagree with, uh, you know, it's like 5 or 10% of that agreement, um, it is possible for the legislature to specifically carve out exceptions to its compliance and implementation of an agreement. 
And so sometimes, right, this is uh, not the end of the negotiation process, but a continuation of it, right? Sometimes the Senate's approval process is a little bit more detailed than just saying yay or nay, right? There, there can be more to it than that. Now, executive agreements are another class of agreement. They have a, a generally have a lower barrier to entry, so to speak, than treaties, uh, but they comprise something like 90 some percent of international agreements uh, to which the U.S. is a party. So they have kind of supplanted treaties, uh, and this is something that goes back uh, well beyond the, the kind of modern era, right, the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, this is a trend that has increased steadily since the nation's founding, uh, but they comprise an, the overwhelming share of U.S. agreements with other countries. Um, and again, they can take on a couple of different forms here. There's the sole executive agreement uh, and also the congressional executive agreement. Now, they differ here with respect to the role of or place of congressional authorization. So a congressional executive agreement requires a joint resolution of Congress requiring only a majority of support before it enters into force. Now, sometimes this might stem from previous congressional authorization or legislation in some specific subject. Um, sole executive agreements enter into force when the document is signed. Now, these agreements are typically negotiated like treaties by members of the executive branch, the State Department, the Defense Department, the Treasury, right? Officials from these three bureaucracies often play a really important role in the negotiation processes. And ultimately, the form that the agreement takes might um, depend on a couple of different things, right? It might depend on how binding presidents want these agreements to be, if they're looking for something that is going to be incredibly durable over time, uh, and also what they think they can get, right? If you think that an agreement is really important, but don't think that you can actually get uh, sufficient congressional backing, you might not pursue a congressional executive agreement or a treaty, right? Because there are, are sort of gradations here with respect to how tough the hurdles are to get by to implementing and securing a deal. Now, even where we don't see uh, congressional um, uh, voting, right, or even perhaps uh, when we look at congressional executive agreements as compared to treaties, there's a lower uh, threshold there in terms of votes. Um, these agreements that are subject to these lower thresholds can at times be just as binding, even though we'll talk about some notable exceptions to this shortly. Um, there are reputational costs to entering into an agreement and then breaking them. So the thinking is to a certain extent that by negotiating and entering into an agreement, a president can potentially tie the hands of legislators now and in the future, as well as future presidents, when it comes to backing out of international agreements, because that will erode other countries' trust in the United States. And so when perhaps presidents of a different party want to enter into uh, negotiations, they might find it more difficult to do so if they've reneged on the agreements of previous administrations. This is how the thinking goes, at least, though there are uh, questions in more recent times about whether this logic still holds, given just extraordinarily high levels of polarization that we see in Washington. Now, an example of uh, an executive agreement here that uh, we've covered a little bit before is the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act of 1934. Um, Congress formerly controlled the power to set tariff levels, but, uh, but legislators delegate authority to the executive branch to negotiate uh, tariff reductions in exchange for like reductions from other countries and basically sign off on this process, limiting themselves to uh, a, an up or down, a yay or nay vote later on uh, in order to streamline the process. Uh, as we've talked about before, this is something that uh, some people have described as um, kind of institutional cooperation, Congress not being able to trust itself and delegating authority to the executive. But if you recall, this really reflects the changing interests of U.S. manufacturers and Republicans and Democrats uh, during the 1930s in the lead up to World War II, and then especially after World War II, uh, where the international economic landscape has just changed dramatically. Um, and so this is really the result of converging interests now, executive agreements and treaties can be combined for uh, the sake of reaching a broader, kind of more robust agreement in different situations. Now, the Soviets began building intercontinental ballistic missiles and anti-ballistic missile batteries in the 1960s. Now, uh, ABMs here, anti-ballistic missile batteries, were really important because they might allow um, uh, a country to engage in uh, 
an assault, right, a first strike attempt, you know, while curbing their losses or reducing their ability uh, to suffer from a retaliatory strike. And so AD, ADMs here were a, a real concern during this time period, and even in the modern era, continue to uh, to be a concern with respect to the U.S. and, uh, and its policies in Western uh, and Eastern Europe. Now, the Johnson administration comes in and starts negotiations in 1967, and formal talks begin under Nixon in 1969. So this is something that traverses uh, presidential administrations. Now, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty is a treaty, and this puts limits on the number of sites and the number of interceptors that each country is allowed to have. The SALT agreement is an executive agreement. Now, this is different, it's, even though it's part of the entire package. Um, the agreement was divided up into two portions, uh, partly based on what the president thought he could achieve in Congress. Now, the SALT agreement put limits on the number of offensive missiles at 1,600 for the USSR and 1,054 for the US. It also restricted the number of submarines capable of launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. The US has a lower number here, but it also has better missile technology in some areas, things like MIRVs, multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles, where you can essentially uh, mount multiple warheads onto a single ICBM and they can target uh, a bunch of different independent targets. Um, th these are technological developments that make it really hard to uh, kind of compare missile for missile because the technologies uh, are very different at different times and the capacity of the two countries are very different at different times. Um, but these complexities make it hard to kind of uh, negotiate a, a clear kind of deal, right? Because you're not really comparing apples to apples and sometimes the uh, numerical disparities here uh, can create problems that cut both ways. Now, part of the SALT-1 agreement also mandates a five-year freeze on the deployment of new offensive nuclear weapons. Now, again, this was an executive agreement and was subject to congressional approval. Now, I know I said that there were two classes of agreements, treaties and executive agreements, but briefly here, there are other things, too, that can uh, pop up that we should talk about. Um, the most uh, prominent recent example of this is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This is also known as the Iran nuclear deal. Now, this is a deal that was begun during the Obama administration and finalized towards the end of the Obama administration. And the goal, as the title suggests, was to limit Iran's capacity to develop nuclear weapons. Now, the parties to the deal included Iran and the P5 plus one, which included China, France, Germany, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The deal was concluded in July of 2015, and the implementation began on January 16th of 2016. Now, 2016 was obviously an election year, and this become a very, became a very contested issue, particularly uh, for many Republicans. Uh, President Donald Trump campaigned in no small part on his promise to uh, withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal, uh, which he, he subsequently did. The deal contained a number of provisions that were designed to limit Iran's ability to develop nuclear weapons. And contrary to a lot of uh, kind of political rhetoric on the subject, uh, this was not something that relied on trust in Iran, right? This is something that um, relied pretty heavily on checks and monitoring and surveillance, both by independent intelligence agencies, but also uh, by the joint efforts of, of these countries, partly through the International Atomic Energy Agency and partly by uh, kind of novel institutions that were set up to monitor and implement the deal. Specifically, the arrangement set limits on Iran's nuclear enrichment capabilities. It set limits on uranium stockpiles, uh, required that Iran sell or remove or dispose of substantial quantities of its uranium stockpiles. Um, activities conducted at various facilities in Iran were heavily monitored and restricted uh, to ensure that they were not able to uh, kind of covertly develop uh, uh, nuclear weapons technologies. Um, Technological acquisitions and kind of their technology pipeline for the development of nuclear energy were closely monitored under the agreement to ensure that they were not uh, importing technologies uh, that would allow them to develop a weapon or divert their efforts uh, to uh, develop nuclear energy for peaceful purposes to more nefarious purposes. Uh, and also required that Iran disassemble and basically break down a number of its reactors and various um, uh, pieces of technological equipment that could be used to enrich uranium and develop nuclear weapons. 
Um, there was a pretty stringent oversight regime, regime that was also established under the agreement. Uh, for example, the International Atomic Energy Agency could inspect any Iranian facility suspected of developing weapons. Uh, it detailed essentially the chain of custody between uh, sampling and, and kind of monitoring sites, right? This is not just going in and looking around, uh, but essentially taking samples of air and surfaces to ensure that um, you know, there's no uh, remnant or no trace that there were radioactive material uh, around, right? Uh, this stuff is uh, stuff that lingers for a long period of time. Uh, and so there was, a, again, a pretty stringent monitoring regime that was put in place. Uh, and it also called for the installation of surveillance cameras at various uh, Iranian facilities uh, to monitor, uh, you know, in a very fine-grained way, what was actually going on in those facilities. So it was an incredibly robust agreement. It was very, very detailed in terms of its provisions. Uh, and again, allowed uh, the US and other um, negotiating states um, pretty substantial access to Iranian facilities and Iranian territory here to monitor what was going on. Uh, and as you know, I'm not a nuclear weapons expert, so there are a lot of folks who are much better uh, able to talk about this. Um, but again, these things are pretty hard to uh, break down and move spontaneously, right? Um, even over the course of a month or two, um, it's hard to break down and move all the equipment, and the equipment often leaves behind traces that monitoring teams could uh, could go in and look for. Now, in spite of all this, this was still a very politically charged issue at the time in the United States, and so what emerges here is a political agreement. This is neither an executive agreement nor a treaty, uh, and so it was based on uh, the idea that the U.S. would be achieving what it wanted to under this agreement, under this framework, uh, that it would be achieving the goal of limiting Iran's capacity to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, and so even though it wasn't legally binding, it would be politically binding because even opponents of the deal were essentially getting what they want. And this obviously turned out to not be the case. Um, but the takeaway here, right, a comprehensive review of this agreement uh, is beyond the scope of this course, but the point here is that there are other things out there aside from treaties and executive agreements that uh, you do see from time to time, right? Even though they are uh, kind of the two main classes that we'll, we'll see. All right, the next category here that we're going to talk about is war and the use of force. Now, the president enjoys some significant advantages, right? There's this idea of, you know, being commander in chief. It gives the president kind of a first mover advantage. The president can often initiate uh, the use of military force, deploy military forces, and Congress is left to react, right? There are often information asymmetries. If you go back to that figure of just the, the massive staff, right, the, the, the enormous number of people who work for the president, this gives presidents a huge informational advantage to know what's going on, right? So if a war is, uh, is in progress and it's not going well, it's easier for the, the president to kind of protect that information and prevent it from getting out to the public and to Congress than it is for Congress to access it, right? Congress is not receiving regular intelligence updates, regular reports in the way that executive branch officials are. Uh, and also over time, technological change, things like drone strikes, for example, uh, have allowed the president a way to use military force that lowers kind of the political cost, right? If we're not putting um, soldiers on the line, that kind of lowers the stakes in some sense for members of Congress. And so there may be less uh, demand for oversight uh, if you know we're not at risk of getting sucked into uh, a conflict that's going to uh, cost a bunch of American lives. Now, the national security bureaucracy has grown tremendously over time, but there were some notable spikes here. Uh, first, under President Roosevelt around World War II, as we've discussed before, but also President George W. Bush, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, um, just existing agencies like the Department of Defense, the National Security Agency, are really ramped up during this time. There's a, an enormous spike in spending. You know, we still don't really know the full extent of kind of the intelligence budget because a lot of these, uh, you know, parts of foreign policy spending are still classified. Um, but there are some moments in time where we do see rapid or drastic expansion of these institutions. Now, an example of the first mover advantage in information asymmetries here is uh, the Vietnam conflict. 
Uh, so the Tonkin Gulf Resolution was a key piece of, of legislation here that was passed on August 7th of 1964 and really gave the president broad discretionary authority to protect American interests in Southeast Asia. Now, the United States had been getting increasingly involved in the conflict in Vietnam going back into the 1950s under the Eisenhower administration, but it really spikes during the Johnson administration about a decade later. The Tonkin Gulf Resolution was the result of a couple of attacks on U.S. warships that were operating in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of Vietnam, uh, gathering intelligence. The first attack didn't provoke military response, and the Johnson administration issued a warning to the North Vietnamese forces uh, and the second series of attacks came a couple of days later after the first series of attacks. And the Johnson administration ended up using this as a case to bolster support for the war and secure broader authority for U.S. involvement. Now, this marks the, the beginning of the real expansion of the U.S. war effort in Southeast Asia. And around the, the high point, we see about 550,000 U.S. personnel and about 55,000 deaths over the course of the conflict. Uh, so 550,000 personnel deployed uh, to the conflict in Vietnam, you know, like the draft, right, is, is occurring during this time period. And so it uh, becomes an incredibly politically contentious issue at home. Uh, but the president had a lot of power to move, right? There were attacks on U.S. assets. And so rather than conducting a lengthy fact-finding mission, right, Congress is pretty quick to delegate authority. And by the time legislators really turn against the war, uh, it's it's too late. And the, after the Johnson administration, the Nixon administration had expanded the war into Laos and Cambodia, conducting a kind of shadow war uh, alongside the, uh, the uh, primary conflict in Vietnam. So Congress is often in a rush to delegate authority in times where it perceives uh, the U.S. to be experiencing some sort of emergency, but it can be really hard to put that back in the bottle, right, once it's, once it's out. It can be hard for Congress to subsequently exercise more stringent uh, oversight authority and checks on the president's behavior. Now, kind of the more modern equivalent of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, uh, there are a couple of uh, authorizations for the use of military force uh, that we see in 2001 and 2002 in the uh, response to the attacks on 9-11, uh, but also in the lead up to the war in Iraq in March of 2003. Now, these two pieces of legislation have provided the basis for a very wide range of military operations under the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and now the Trump administration, um, and have sparked some serious concerns and serious conversations uh, that they uh, you know, need to be reined in, that presidents, again, need to be reined in, and that these pieces of legislation have been stretched beyond their original intent. So again, kind of reflecting back to that previous point, right, Congress is often in a hurry to delegate power to the president and authority to the president, um, but presidents, once they have this power, regardless of the party, very often tend to run with it and are loath to cede power back to Congress uh, unless they are forced to do so. Uh, but the 2001 AUMF here was drafted, as I mentioned, in response to the September 11th attacks. Uh, and the key provision here is section two, subsection A, which says, quote, that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Now, at first uh, glance, this might not seem that remarkable, but the language in it is incredibly broad. Right, use all necessary and appropriate force against nations, organizations, and persons. This is not limited to Afghanistan or the Taliban. Right, this is um, you know a pretty a pretty broad framework here for uh, viewing the president's uh, sort of response uh, to the September 11th attacks. Now, similarly, we see another AUMF in 2002 in the lead up to the the war in Iraq. Uh, it specifically expresses Congress's support for the president to enforce UN Security Council resolutions against Iraq and to pressure uh, the UN Security Council to ensure that Iraq complies with UN Security Council resolutions. 
Like the 2001 AUMF, it also grants the president a pretty broad authority, and it also ties into the 2001 AUMF in the aim of targeting those, quote, nations, organizations, or persons who planned, authorized, or committed, or aided terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th. Now, remember, as we've uh, talked about before, the Bush administration did make an effort to tie in uh, the September 11th attacks to Saddam Hussein and his regime, uh, even though this proved to be false. Um, the president did try to make the case to invade Iraq, partly by invoking September 11th. Now, these pieces of legislation, again, have been used over time and across administrations, uh, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail, uh, but specifically, there have been a few kind of prominent uh, conflicts where these pieces of legislation have been invoked. Uh, in 2014, there were operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, the war against the Islamic State, uh, was rooted partially in or justified uh, partially by invoking the uh, AUMFs. Uh, in 2016, operations against al-Shabaab in Somalia, and more recently in 2019, the killing of Major General Qasem Soleimani, uh, the leader of Iran's Quds forces. All of these conflicts, all of these uh, military operations were justified using these uh, pieces of legislation. Maybe not necessarily exclusively these pieces of legislation, but they have been invoked uh, at a number of different times. Uh, now, one of the things that I did here that I want to show you is scraping some Congressional Research Service reports on instances where um, the president has uh, called for military action and what legal basis they have used to justify that military action. Uh, now, each dot represents a single military operation, and the color of that dot corresponds to the basis, uh, 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 the legislative, right, the sort of institutional basis um, on which the president is kind of claiming authority here. So red indicates that the president is only relying on Article II uh, powers of the Constitution here to justify their actions. Blue indicates they're leaning on the AUMF from 2001. Green represents the uh, Iraq AUMF from 2002, and purple indicates that they're invoking all three. Now, as you can see here, um, early on in the Bush administration, Bush leans pretty heavily on the 2001 AUMF, but notably here we see that uh, towards the end of his first term and into his second term, we really see Bush relying more exclusively on the Constitution specifically. Now, starting in the Obama administration, interestingly enough, right, we start to see Obama as the one who relies more heavily on the 2001 AUMF. Now, uh, reports indicate that the Obama administration, its members, were more concerned about having a more robust legal justification for taking more expansive military action against terrorists. Sort of perversely, right, even though Obama campaigned as kind of an anti-war president, um, Obama ends up really paving the way for using this or invoking this legislative authority and kind of uh, creating this, this norm, if you will, uh, that proceeds into or persists into the Trump administration later. Uh, notably, towards the end of Obama's administration, but the first year of Trump's administration, um, President Trump invokes not just the 2001 AUMF, but all three uh, of these um, uh, sort of bases, right, for, for taking military action at different points in time. Now, if we look here, we can see uh, just the, the same sort of scatter plot, but broken down by continuing versus new military action. So obviously there's this accrual over time in terms of ongoing military operations that increases throughout the Bush uh, administration, drops down a little bit, but throughout the Obama and the Trump administrations, we see a steady increase in the number of ongoing military operations with about two, three, four, five new operations beginning each year. Um, now, this is uh, just gives you some sense of kind of longer, uh, you know, more enduring missions. We're not talking about like firing on a fishing boat here. A lot of this is uh, not just against uh, groups like Islamic State, but, um, you know, military efforts to uh, maybe hunt down affiliated organizations or Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So not only have we seen... Um, uh, kind of the number of conflicts expand, but the geographic area in which those conflicts are occurring is also expanding uh, pretty steadily throughout this time. Now, after Vietnam in 1973, we see the passage of the War Powers Resolution. Uh, 
Now, again, this is a time of divided government, and there's a sense that Congress needs to rein in uh, the imperial presidency. During the Johnson and Nixon administrations, U.S. military activism throughout Southeast Asia has increased dramatically. Um, Anti-war sentiment within the U.S. Has, has grown tremendously over this time period. And so there is some uh, sense that there is a, a greater effort required to rein in the president's war-making powers. Now, under the War Powers Resolution, the president can use force without a declaration of war to protect U.S. territory, protect American forces stationed outside the U.S., or to protect American citizens in certain situations. Um, Congress must be notified within 48 hours. This is kind of a key component. There's a, an explicit kind of consultation requirement or information requirement here uh, where Congress be kept in the loop uh, and there is a, a clock that's put on this, right? Where Congress, uh, you know, un ostensibly understands that the president sometimes has to act, uh, but that Congress should be quickly and dutifully informed uh, thereafter. The act also requires that the president get authorization within 60 days uh, or 90 days if troops are in danger or else withdrawing troops is mandatory. Uh, Congress can also demand a withdrawal by a ma majority vote that is not subject to a veto. So on its face, this looks really good. It looks like it solves a lot of the problems, uh, but the act is rarely invoked and really never enforced and really never challenged legally in court uh, to determine the, the sort of legal or constitutional authority uh, that uh, you know either branch is, is typically claiming, though it does tend to uh, provide a starting point for negotiations between Congress and the president over the use of force. Um, no president, notably, has ever admitted to being bound by the act because of the lack of veto power over it. This is something where members of the executive branch have even come out against members of their own party at times and kind of cautioned them about trying to strengthen the act or trying to uh, interfere, right, trying to prevent the legislature from interfering too much in the foreign policy making powers of the president. Uh, James Baker, who is George Bush Sr. Secretary of State and a Republican, testified in 1995 before the House International Relations Committee um, and warned fellow Republicans who had just taken control of Congress and were looking to uh, limit the Clinton administration's powers. Um, Baker warned them that the U.S. still had a major role to play in international affairs and, and cautioned them against tying the president's hand, uh, basically saying that the president needed tools at their disposal and needed flexibility to respond to international emergencies. And so there is some sense that people who have executive experience uh, do tend to be biased in favor of more flexibility, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, with respect to executive power uh, when it comes to war making. Now, we've talked a lot about the presidential advantages here, but there are a lot of ways in which members of Congress can push back. Um, as I've talked about before, tenure and expertise are really important, right? Members of Congress often serve in office for long periods of time. When they have been in office for a long period of time, right, they tend to develop a lot of expertise. And even though they don't have the staffs or the budgeting, this can be a very important method for members of Congress to kind of even the playing field uh, especially if members of Congress have served in the military or the intelligence community or the U.S. diplomatic corps, right? They might know a lot about foreign affairs. Members of Congress also have legislative and budgetary powers. Um, they have oversight powers. They have approval of appointments. There are a number of ways in which they can check the president's behavior. Um, if they don't like an ongoing military operation, they may not necessarily be able to, at any given point in time, directly legislate uh, that military operation, but they can hit the president in other areas that they care about, right? If the president has a domestic policy agenda that they really want to see advanced, members of Congress can threaten that agenda to get what they want in this other space, right? This is this idea of issue linkage, right? They can kind of tie issues together. They can deny presidential appointments. Um, you know, they can deny funding for uh, government agencies. Um, you know, they have other, other tools at their disposal. They can also appeal to the public and, and hold press conferences, right? Hold public hearings in order to get information and to attempt to influence public opinion to hold the president to account and increase public pressure uh, on the president. Um, now, there is evidence here that divided government um, can correlate with a lower likelihood of using military force, but also shorter duration military operations. So even though Congress is often left in kind of a second mover position, there is evidence that where uh, Congress is controlled by the opposition party, Congress can 
um, brings some pressure to bear on presidents to either not use force or to reduce uh, kind of the scope or the duration of those, those instances where they do use force. However, over time, we've seen congressional involvement really decline quite a bit. This figure here shows you the total number of committee hearing days uh, focusing on defense, international affairs, and trade issues over time. And especially with uh, defense here, we can see that there has been a steady decline in the number of committee days uh, allocated to hearings on defense uh, over time. Uh, starting in about the late 1970s, early 1980s, we also see a steady decline in the number of uh, hearing days on international affairs. And over the, the last 20, 30 years or so, we see a pretty steady decline in the number of hearing days on trade issues as well. So even though Congress does have power, um, there is evidence that Congress is exercising its oversight powers less over time. Now, this is where we get back to Newstat's earlier point, right? There's a really, really important point to make here, and that's that Congress has tools. They have powers. They share powers with the executive. But in many cases, congressional leaders or party leaders are deciding to not use those oversight powers, right? As polarization has gotten worse, um, you know, this could be one of the explanatory factors here uh, underlying this decline in oversight, particularly during periods where, um, uh, you know, we have unified government, right? Uh, parties may be less willing to criticize or to hold presidents of their party to account. Now, a couple of other examples of how Congress can kind of go public to influence uh, kind of the, the discourse, right, the public discourse or public pressure uh, the presidents are subject to. Uh, this is a picture of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel. Uh, he was invited to speak by House Speaker John Boehner before a joint session of Congress on March 3rd of uh, 2015. Um, he was speaking specifically against the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Notably, Boehner did not consult with the State Department before inviting Netanyahu. Um, and this is, this is kind of a, a rare, relatively rare event, right, to give a foreign leader this kind of platform before a joint session of Congress. And so critics viewed this as uh, an attempt to undermine Obama's foreign policy goals of negotiating the joint comprehensive plan with Iran. Um, and also to boost Netanyahu's own political fortunes because Israel was holding elections just a couple of weeks after this event. Um, this letter here is another example tied to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, this was a, an open letter uh, on behalf of Republican senators to the Iranian government drafted by Republican Senator Tom Cotton uh, that basically sought to give the Iranian leadership a, a kind of lesson on U.S. institutions and kind of warning, or, or perhaps more accurately, threatening the Iranian government that uh, any agreement that the Obama administration negotiated with them might be undone uh, by subsequent administrations. Now, Republicans have long been hawkish about uh, the prospects of the Iran deal. They continue to be hawkish about it. Uh, even as the U.S. has withdrawn, there's this kind of strange uh, continued effort to evoke the Iran deal as though it were still in place. And, and this is something we'll talk about more when we get into the policymaking lecture here. Uh, Republicans have been much more in favor of the use of military force uh, as a response to or a solution to the prospect of Iran uh, developing nu nuclear weapons. And so this was viewed as kind of a public effort to derail uh, the negotiations between the Obama administration and the other um, countries that were a party to the deal, as we mentioned before, and Iran specifically. And so members of Congress, again, can and do often take very public stances in an effort to curb the ability of presidents to conduct foreign policy. So, okay, uh, just to wrap up, right, what have we learned? Um, a lot of these traditional views of kind of conflicting institutions, right, they don't really hold water. Um, oftentimes we see increased conflict at periods of divided government between parties when they, they control different institutions. Um, and Congress and the president, members of, of Congress and the president, all cater to more particularistic constituencies, right? Um, it's not that they don't care about, um, you know, what we might think of as the national interest, but they also often have uh, much more narrow concerns that they're trying to advance. And so this is true of presidents and members of Congress, right? If we think of the, the basic kind of electoral geography and math, uh, even of, of, of presidents, it becomes clear that uh, the people to whom they answer, it's rarely, if ever, the entire population.
Uh, we've also talked about the idea that the executive branch and Congress share powers. Now, again, this is really important because they share powers across a number of areas. And it means that when Congress doesn't act, it's really a choice, right? It's either a choice of party leaders uh, or a sort of collective choice of individual uh, party members, of individual legislators, or it means that there is sufficient conflict within Congress that party leadership can't uh, you know, assemble the requisite coalition to push back in a more meaningful way. But this slight tweak to our framing is really important because it, again, emphasizes that Congress does have powers. Uh, they do have powers as an institution. So, okay, thank you for joining me today. I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe. And I will see you next week when we start talking about the State Department. Bye-bye.